Today, a deep dive into the world of labor, workers, jobs, and how robots could change everything. I'm Alexis Scordato, and this is Future Forward. Today, as robots loom on the horizon, one politician says he has a plan. Then we'll go even further. What if robots replace politicians? I'm Steven Rosenbaum, or an algorithm program to sound like Steven Rosenbaum. Let us launch. Hey, Alexa. Hi, Robot Steve. Robot Steve at your service. I could do a little, thing. yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, this is not the episode where we're going to talk in depth about deep fakes, but uh, I did see a pretty extraordinary deep fake app the other day. It, it's uh, it's probably something we should put on our Put a, put a pin in it and come back to it. Uh, I've seen some disturbing but, ones like Jim Carrey on some actress and. Uh, but but we have th- we have um, we have three chapters today. Uh, part one is Labor Day 2040 when robots take your job. Part two is politics. What if a president gets it right and robots put money in your pocket, which is interesting. And then part three, which is maybe the most. Well, no, three is surprising and four is shocking. Three is, did robots help elect Donald Trump? Uh, And there's some good evidence in that one. And then part four is, what if robots become politicians? Which you didn't see that one coming, did you? No, this this is like an onion. You just peeled (laughs) it back and then I got to the fourth layer and I had tears in my eyes. Yeah, (laughs) ooh, well played. All right, so as we get into Labor Day, Let's just start with our friends from IEEE. This is IEEE Spectrum Magazine. Uh, terrifically well-reported, thoughtful piece on the impact of robots and automation on working conditions and employment. A, a light, by the way, not a frothy article, pretty pretty, uh, pretty dense. But, uh, you know, th- th- was there anything in there that jumped out of you and made you go, wait, I didn't know that we'd gone that far? You know, I've read more articles that talk about, you know, ah, the robots are coming for your jobs and this is potentially a bad thing. I think this article reminds me that, you know, there are a lot of dangerous jobs out there where the idea of robots replacing those workers is potentially like a really great benefit. So give, give, just give us an example. I mean, there might just be like assembly lines, right? Where, or, uh, where there's machinery involved and you know, when you just think about uh, the possibility of employers having employees having to either work long shifts, be doing lots of repetitive behaviors, uh, maybe poor conditions, you know, having robots do that sounds like a, a potentially good solution. So, so here was the paragraph I circled. So this is a quote from the IEEE article. It says, far from the image of robots serving humans, the reality is in fact, the other way around. Human staff are just cattle there to serve the robots. Harsh. Ouch. Way harsh. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And I'll, I'll drop that in. Now, interestingly enough, a lot of the, of the links from this show are from 2018. So for whatever reason, 2019 robots, not so interesting, I guess. But, but um, what, 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 what did you take away from this one? What was the thing that made you go, yeah, I get that? I mean, I think it's just, it, it, in some ways, the article is written from the future, Labor Day 2040, and it's talking about all of these events over the course of, I guess, you know, 1900s on, and you can actually see it playing out to be true that one day Labor Day is obsolete because robots have sort of taken over. So like, can you imagine a time when you have a, a robot helper in your apartment? Absolutely. I mean, we already <laughs> have things like it, like the Roomba. Yeah. You have a, do you have a Roomba? Yeah. I've never bought a Roomba. You know, as a robot person, you'd think I would buy one. Uh, we briefly had a robot window cleaner um, but we returned it because Pam was afraid it was going to fall to the street and kill someone. I don't even know what that is, though. Like It was like a... Inside or the outside? Outside. You put it on the outside. It has a big suction on it. It had a safety cable. And it it wasn't really a robot robot, but it ran up. It, think of it like a sideways Roomba with like a dishwasher rag inside it. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, all right. So, so we buy the 2040 
which is not that far away, right? I mean, it sounds so su- right. Yeah, it's 20 years or mm-hmm. yeah, 20 years. All right, so so let's let's move along to this this next uh, piece. So this is the the Larry Boyer um, uh, uh, medium piece, and I'll just I'll I'm gonna read just a clip which I cut out. Um, this is Boyer writing. He says, "A lot has changed in more than 100 years since Labor Day was first recognized and celebrated." Two world wars, space travel, penicillin, the evolution from rural to urban society, evolution from an agriculture to manufacturing to service economy. Most of us, Labor Day, or for, to most of us, Labor Day origins are long forgotten, long in the history books, abandoned on library shelves. But what's more, in the context of our modern society, on the cusp of a fourth industrial revolution, what does Labor Day mean now? And, and I guess. The, the reason why that caught me by surprise was I was like, wait, cusp of a fourth industrial revolution. Does any, has anybody said that? Do we know that like is cusp or were that we past like the first c- reference I've, I've read about it, but he's referencing like a, a robot revolution, a robot revolution. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and this has all been the realm of science fiction mostly, right? I mean, like, you know, lots of kind of goofy robots, but, you know, not something you could go to Best Buy and pick up a humanoid kitchen cleaner. Yeah, that's like Jetsons. Style. It is a little Jetsons. Um, but 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 I thought Boyer's argument, and in fact, what this whole pod is kind of structured around is, you know, the nature of work has always been humans came first, and even if humans had tools, whether it be a, you know, a you know the Ford assembly line or a robot helping build parts the humans were always pretty much in charge yeah. like like they ran them they fixed them they programmed them so maybe robots made humans super powerful but but this conflict that says maybe they actually take our jobs um that's you know we we, we can now make that argument pretty reasonably yeah it's the best of times the worst of times uh, now to be fair, you know, part of why this is easy for you and I to chit chat about is the likelihood that your strategy job or my various jobs are going to be robot operated uh, in our lifetime is pretty slim. Like, right. The everyone is thinking that robots will replace low income, unskilled labor and that the jobs that sort of the higher earning spectrum, sort of, I guess the knowledge worker, early adopters, those categories will continue to expand. Right. You know, the other day uh, we took a trip to across the country and we were in Texas and driving around in back roads and Google was telling us to take a right turn here and turn around in this cul-de-sac here. And I thought, you know, we don't even, it was never a moment where mapping technology just made us go holy shit how did they do that how did they map the planet and know when a street was under construction so they could remap it so that like it's shockingly accurate yeah so it's interesting it's a different episode but i'm i'm in sardinia right now and i can't rely on google maps as much as i would like and there's this whole other story, too, about being in an early adopter market like the United States and sort of the digital lag in countries like Italy. Is it, well, we, yeah. Well, well, you know what? We have time. Spend a minute on that. Like, is it more calm? I mean, does it take weight off your shoulders? Yeah, so it's relevant to this episode because I think when you think about robots replacing work, there is this benefit that people believe will come true, which is we will have a higher, a higher quality of life. Instead of working, we'll have more time to spend on hobbies, leisure, family. Uh, I've actually found uh, this summer that to be true in the sense that I've experienced communities and towns that are less digitally enabled, like there's just no Wi-Fi or there are no tech hubs or people aren't on their phones in restaurants. And what you get is a slower pace of life. You get a deeper connection to physical land and you have people who are uh, developing tactile skills 
whether that's making honey or sewing clothes or some type of, I don't know, or cooking, right? Uh, it just seems like that's something that we're moving away from in the United States. And it is something that I have probably appreciated the most uh, during my time abroad. I, as you were saying that, I was just imagining you sitting in a little cafe and thinking, the food must taste better. Yeah, the food tastes better when I'm not flipping through tweets about, you know, storms and crazy politicians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> all, all right. So so the the third clip that we pulled was this CNN piece from 2019. Uh, the headline is, the robots are coming for your jobs. And, um, you know, the CNN, you know, I mean, all of the expected stuff in the first graph, Terminator, Jetsons, you know, et cetera. Um, but um, it, it was, I thought, as compelling an argument as I've read that said, this isn't a, an, a, an if, but a when. Like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, 2040 is not far i think i was just having a dinner conversation about this with friends in the way that we think about digital media and the internet killing journalism local news newspapers i think we're going to experience a similar shift when it comes to robots taking jobs or automation it's not a light switch there's still journalists who are employed there's still newspapers but it is very clear that the way we consume news is different. The way supply chain will be managed in the future will be fundamentally different. So the first time this hit me, I got invited to a fun political fundraiser. I mean, not, not a big dollar, you know, thousand dollar plate thing. I think it was 25 or 50 bucks. And it was a friend of mine who I like, and he said, come see this candidate. And this was early in the presidential cycle. And so I went and I'd never heard the name or seen Andrew Yang until I saw him in a room with 50 people. And he spoke very eloquently about two things, the, the coming kind of tidal wave of income inequality. And when he talked about robots, which he talked about at this particular uh, discussion at length, he talked very specifically about truck drivers, drivers. And he said, look, this is the math here is not complicated. Driverless autonomous vehicles exist. They work. There's some issues with getting, you know, the laws sorted out and getting insurance sorted out. But there's no doubt there are going to be autonomous trucks and cars on the road kind of in the foreseeable future. And and already you know, you can get in your Tesla and tell it to drive you across country and you're not breaking any laws by doing that. And it will be, you know, you know, it's assisted, right? They, they don't say driverless. They say assisted. And you have to sit in the front seat for the time being. Um, but when when truck drive, when drivers, delivery drivers, truck drivers, cab drivers, Uber drivers go away, and I'm going to I'm going to guess at the number because it was a maybe a year ago, but I think the number that he pegged that out was like 60,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. I just, think, well, the truck drivers is like something three and a half million yeah, is people it, yeah, affected. It, yeah. yeah. So, it's, so it's a great big swatch of society, and those jobs aren't like, you're not going to sue them back into existence. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to they're gonna go away. Um, and, you know, so the thing that the CNN piece talks about is robots equaling inequality, which is not anything I'd ever really processed before. I think we have to consider that if robots are going to replace certain jobs, those people are not going to find other jobs as easily. Like where if 300, if three and a half million jobs are lost, then upskilling or reskilling um, that workforce, um, I mean, the implications of that are massive. Like, yeah. It's not the same as you or I learning a new version of Photoshop or switching from Trello to another, 
you know, device to organize our schedule. It, it, you know, I, it would be as if your whole life you spoke one language and almost inevitably the world changed and the thing that you knew intuitively, which was how to drive a truck and you loved and it was your livelihood, goes away. Yeah, I mean, it would it would be the equivalent of if you and I had to manufacture, like farm our own food. I don't know how to do that. Oh, I don't know, though. I mean, I'm not sure that's the equation because I think I think you could teach me how to plant and call. I, I mean, I, it would be backbreaking work. Don't get me wrong. I've not, you know, mm-hmm. I worked on a farm one summer and uh, but all right. So let me, let me read you a quote from Yang, because this will take us kind of where I want to go. Uh, this is a quote. Uh, from, from the Atlantic. Um, we need to wake people up, Yang said. The reality of what Donald Trump, uh, uh, the reality of why Donald Trump is our president today is because we already blasted away millions of American jobs and the people feel like they lost a path forward. So do you buy and, that? What? Do you buy that? So I don't buy it from him alone, but if you then go forward, there's a bunch of reporting that essentially is about the places where the electorate is unstable and therefore looking to take, you know, Trump said, I'm going to put you in a time machine and go backwards to the good old days. And when he meant good old days, he meant where you had a job. Mm-hmm. And and there there was a report. I'm going to not try and remember what it is. Um, it's all, I mean, there's a there's a whole bunch of, of Yang coverage that essentially says, you know, he, he didn't make up the idea that Trump was elected by robots. That's a that's a there, there is kind of a, a body of evidence that backs that up. Yeah, I think I do buy it. Mm, OK, I mean, I think the New York Mag article basically talks about what he what he gets right, what he gets wrong. What they poke at is, you know, there isn't necessarily direct correlation in swing states related to robots and automation. But they do sort of get at this idea that what what has sort of made Andrew Yang surge in the polls is closer to what helped get Donald Trump elected, which is, I think, speaking to this American who doesn't have a path forward and uh, feels sort of lost in the shuffle. So th- th- there's I've been to a couple of different panel discussions about minimum basic income Mm -hmm. and you know it's gone from that's a ridiculous idea or that's a pipe dream you know when you when you look for example at what it costs to incarcerate someone the cost of the sheer size of people that are in prisons in the u.s if paying someone thirteen thousand dollars a year a thousand dollars a month would be enough of a basic cushion so that they could look for the right job, you know, feed themselves, have a roof over their head. It, you know, you can make it, Yang makes a, I mean, so Yang, before he started kind of going at robots, he started with uh, basic minimum income, or OBI. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, what, I, what's the acronym for? Uh, Universal basic income, UBI. U, UB, it's, I think it's universal basic income. Mm-hmm. Um, that was where he started. And, you know, you could argue if you wanted to be a little cynical, he's growing in the polls because he's offering to give voters a lot of cash. What? I don't, I mean, this is hard for me to wrap my head around, like $1,000 a month. What, what can you really do with that? $12,000 a year. Um, you know, usually I, I think I think you're speaking from your 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 Brooklyn bubble. I think this that's totally the, totally. Yeah. So, I mean, ten thousand percent yes. Like so, explain to me like the math, like twelve thousand dollars. Where in the United States do I go, and I have twelve thousand dollars in cash and I'm okay? Um, I don't think that that's. I don't think I don't think it pays all your bills. I don't think that's the question. I think the question is, if you're working a minimum wage job and you're just barely making ends meet and you have no bandwidth to take a course or think about your next thing or, 
you know, to, to think outside of survival, it's the padding that that makes it possible for you to actually build a life as opposed to literally just, you know, I mean, I mean, how often have you used, you know, a payday loan? You like, mean like your, a... your check, your check didn't come, and so you have to go borrow at twenty six percent to get you through the weekend. Oh no, I haven't. Yeah, right. Yeah. But there's a whole industry that mm -hmm. survives on people that need payday, you know, that that literally borrow extremely expensive money so that they can go out, you know, and have a beer because their pay their paycheck is late or because you know they they lost a shift or you know I mean all that stuff. Wow. So. Yeah, no, I mean, what, what, what Yang is getting at is, you know, trying to replace in, income insecurity with in, income security. Hmm. Um, and he makes the argument in person quite passionately and quite authentically. Are you uh, surprised that he's doing as well as he is? Um, uh, let me answer that in the best way I can. Uh, I think all polls are bullshit. Okay. <laughs> I mean, if you buy the polls, then President Clinton, Hillary would be in the White House today. So, like, I think all polls are, polls are bullshit. I think they 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 call landlines, not cell phones. You know, I don't know. I mean, do you have you ever d taken a poll? Have you ever not hung up on a pollster when they called you? No, I've never taken one. I mean, I, how would they find me? Like, I don't have a phone. Well, I mean, you you have a cell phone. I mean, I do have a cell phone, but it's like, I think I associate polls with like landlines, like growing up. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've hung up, I've hung, hung up on three or four of them over the years. Mm -hmm. And so, look, I just think I, I my, my pollster friends are going to be mad at me for this, but I just, I just, I think it's way too early. I think, you know, I, I don't get job approval. I don't get any of those things. Um, but, but here's, here's the potentially kooky or not kind of pivot here. So Elon Musk has come out and said he's going to back Andrew, Andrew Yang. I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all. If he's going to back someone, he's going to back the hypothesis for, you know, the, the person who probably is most closely aligned with his worldview. What, what do you think his worldview is? Like robots are... Yeah, I think I think everything Elon Musk does is going to accelerate this change. Well, he well hold on, hold on. But he's got a separate separate conversation. But Musk has a passionate dangers of AI on the horizon speech he gives. Oh yeah, and he's like building up. He he thinks we need to build up like a defense uh, system to actually like fight against the robots the ro when yeah, right. AI wins. Yeah. So I, that's what I mean. His he he believes that future is inevitable, and so he's calling his shot on the politician who also thinks that future is inevitable. Uh, all right, we we, we um b because we enjoyed this conversation this so much we pulled a lot of clips, but um but there there was a there's a New York Times op-ed by Thomas Edsel, um, also 2018. But but the headline just caught my eye. It said, "Robots can't vote, but they helped elect Donald Trump." And you know, his argument and there's a uh, there's a pretty good for those of you who want to look. I'll put a link in the in the show notes. There's a pretty good picture, and the headline, which is I thought pretty cheeky for the New York Times, is "Where Robots Live," and it essentially said. It's no coincidence that this map sheds light on President Trump's electoral college vic victory in 2016. So, the more there, the more robots there are, the more in income insecurity there is. Yeah. Now, when we talk about robots and AI, how much do you think of software only, hardware plus software? Because I think some people think robots. They think it has to be like a you know, a Jetsons type thing that resembles a person. When I hear robots, I also think of bots like Twitter bots or ad tech bots. And maybe we should make that distinction. 
So I'll just I'll give you a good example. Um, I have I use a storage company and for some stuff that I have and and I got an email from them saying that they lost one of my boxes. So I emailed back and said, "What do you mean?" They said, "Oh, you have to file a claim because we've lost one of your boxes." I emailed back and said, "What do you mean?" And I got an email back from another name of a person, and he said, "Oh, don't worry about that. Um, that that was an automated email. We didn't really lose it. We've misplaced it, but don't mm. don't file the claim. We're gonna sort it out." And then today I got an email from the guy, the name that said, "Ignore that robot," saying, "File a claim." But now I'm not sure if he's a robot too. When companies <laughs> use human names for automated emails, yeah, like does it at some point as a customer, I'm like, I'm sorry, what part of this is an algorithm and what part of this is a? And you know, there's this new thing in support where the, people sign these emails, but you can, the email is a generic response, so you can mm -hmm. never get to that person again. Yep. So no one's tracking your issue. Anyway, um, I I, uh, I think the answer is you're right. People think of robots as machines, maybe building cars or, you know, but but you're saying any piece of software that replaces a human being is a robot. Yes, because it's it's running through a machine, right? Like you, I can I can write a script uh, like a bot on my computer and it's running through a device and then it's experienced through a device. So. If I try and respond to any chatbot that wants to either help me pay a bill or answer a question or set up a refund, that's just me interacting with a robot and an algorithm. Mm hmm Yeah, that's creepy. I guess I guess I was I thought of that more like automation, but not a robot. But it's I mean, of course they're so related. But I, I think that is a worthwhile discussion, which is like uh, not necessarily now, but automation, AI, bots, robots. We almost need a uh, clear taxonomy around all of these things because um, maybe it's a spectrum. All right, so, so let's get to the fourth chapter because it's the one that blew my mind as I was going down this rabbit hole and I was glad that you felt the same way, which is what, you know, if, if you buy the argument that Trump's, Trump was, was elected at least in part by robots one way or another, then the question becomes what happens when robots become politicians. And that, you know, I, I stumbled into that and then started Googling it to see if it was a kind of a, a sidebar story. And it turns out it's a pretty prevalent conversation. Like, yeah. robots become politicians. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure I fully understand how to, maybe that's its own idea. Um, I mean, you the robot has to be programmed by a person and so making the link that people's political beliefs can be coded and uh, communicated via a device a piece of software machinery that's that's not far-fetched i think it's the robot's ability to influence act and you know, determine legislation. That's where I my brain kind of breaks. <laughs> so, a couple of years ago, in his typically fabulous way, Michael Moore ran a potted plant for president, and he he ran a ficus. Mm -hmm. Now the ficus didn't win, but the ficus did get some votes. So, like, could we come up with some Steve and Alexa programmed? politician and and call, give it a humanoid name and character and could people vote for it uh, I'm good I don't know if people would vote for it but I can definitely see it coming close in the sense that you can I don't know you you could probably say like okay this this robot candidate has been programmed to be a moderate with the platform of a, you know, liberal New Yorker and, I don't know, moderate right wing, blah, blah, blah. Like, you can almost picture, like, what a pie chart looked like and platforms. And it's like, this is what this robot is, you know, programmed to believe. 
and they're going to act every single way based off of this. That is actually powerful in the sense that you kind of wish every single politician did that. They, they campaign on certain platforms, but once they're elected into office, their voting and, and sort of the legislation that they advocate for isn't always aligned with what they said in the campaign. I, I would almost just start with, what about a robot ro voter? What about if instead of standing in line at my polling place for four hours, I could send you know my robot to go and vote for me? Mm. I could program it with all the candidates I want and they'd say, just go in and push the button for me. I mean, this yeah, is I like, know, I, know. I would honestly rather vote through my iPhone. It, it has my fingerprint, which is like a unique identifier to me. I would literally rather install an app to vote on my phone and vote with my fingerprint. Well, a lot of people are trying to figure out how to do that. Uh, okay, so, so just to end on an upbeat note, I had this idea and I wanted to fly it by you. So there's this big controversy. All of the people that are manufacturing all of these new voting platforms, all the so it seems like all the software comes from Russia, which has people freaked out. Here's what I don't get. You and I know a lot of people in tech. Some of them are very wealthy. Why couldn't they raise their hand and say, we're going to build in America the voting software you need for these different voting machines. And you know what? We're going to give it away. And it's going to be completely transparent. It's going to have a paper trail. It's going to address all the issues people are freaked out about. But why wouldn't one of the 15 people we know who you know, earned themselves a couple hundred million dollars or more say, I'm going to spend the next two years and write the best damn voting software that, that works on the platforms that are already out there, not the machines, but the software, and it'll, it'll be, we'll give it away. I mean, that's almost like a, an, an open source voting booth. Oh my God, that's such a good idea. It's an open source voting booth. Yeah, I mean, that's what you really want. It's the only way to actually make it uh, like protected from, you know, bad, bad foreign entities right. <laughs> rigging and, elections. And, and it would run on blockchain. Yeah. Is somebody working on that? If one of our listeners is working on a blockchain open source voting solution, this would be the time to let us know about it because we will pimp the shit out of it for the next yeah, year. For sure. Um, all right. Well, with that, we have run out of time. Um, robots as politicians, robots as voters, open source voting. Not a light show, but really fun. Totally. Good Labor Day show. Indeed. And have a safe trip back and we'll see you back in the States. Thanks, Steve. Hi, Alexa.